Well, having studied 1 Peter together last quarter, now we're going to move right into this study of 2 Peter, where Peter is addressing an entirely different situation than he was addressing in his first letter. And we'll talk about, and we'll discover as we read on what that purpose is for why Peter wrote this second epistle here in just a few minutes. We'll begin that today. But first, let me go over, like I did in 1 Peter, let me just make explicit the two goals that I have for our quarter-long study for this class. So the first goal of this study is that by the end of this quarter, you'll be able to articulate the purpose and meaning of Peter's second letter and how it applies to current circumstances. So if I ask you right now, what is 2 Peter all about? Why did he write it? Could you answer that question? Now, I'll be honest with you, before I started studying this letter, I couldn't. 2 Peter was just a letter that I, I didn't even have a memory of when the last time was I, I had been in a class on 2 Peter. So if you're like me and you're in that situation where you're thinking, well, I, I don't really know how I'd articulate this, and I don't know what 2 Peter is really about, then my goal for the class, my first goal is, by the end of this quarter, you'll be able to articulate that after our time together. But it's also important to me that we look at how it applies. So not just what Peter, why he was writing and what the letter is all about, but how that would apply to modern Christian living and circumstances. And so I periodically throughout, I'll be stopping and making those applications as you're familiar with if you were in my first Peter class. But I also hope that you will be discovering and thinking about how this would apply to modern Christian circumstances and that you would share those with us as we go out in the study, as I stop and, and give the floor over to you to share your thoughts. But a second goal that I have for the class is the same second goal I had for First Peter. I really want you to grow in your ability to interpret the biblical text. I want you to be spending time in Second Peter yourself before you come to class with us on Sundays so that you can engage with the text and you can discover things about what Peter is saying and how it applies. And if you do that, I promise you, you will get more out of this quarter long class than you would if you just never read Second Peter and then you just showed up and just heard me talk about it. Now you'll get some things about that. I'll certainly have things to share. But if you're studying it on your own and you're engaging with the text yourself and you're growing in that ability to be able to interpret the text and, and chew on it, then I promise you, you'll get more out of this study. Now, to help in that, with those two goals, I've got new books for you. If you're in my first Peter class, you're familiar with this. And uh, Cooper's going to help me. He's going to pass the books out to, uh, to my left side of the room over here. So if you want a copy, we have plenty. Just raise your hand and Cooper will give you a copy. And then Keegan's going to get my right side of the room. And the books are up here. So if you like a book, just raise your hand and these, these gentlemen will... Hand them out to you. I'll say a few more things about them in just a second. Thank you, brother. Can I get a few more? Thank you. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. So again, if you'd like a book, just raise your hand. These gentlemen will pass them out to you. We have plenty of copies. Don't be afraid to take one. These are yours to keep. You can write in them. Keegan, could you just do your job and stop playing around, please? <laughs> that's, yeah, I know, it's true. Yeah, when he's working for free, he can do what he wants. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. All right. Now, this book, just like my, in my first Peter book, this book has questions for each lesson that are designed to help you to get into the text and to get you thinking about the text before we come together and look at it. My email address is on the bottom of the front cover. So if there's something that you don't get a chance to share in class or if there's a question in the book that you're, it's just not clear, it may be clear to me, but maybe it's not clear to you. Or if you've got something in the class that you think, you know, I kind of disagree with what Nathan said, I, I'll email him about it. 
or whatever. You just have something to share. Please feel free to utilize my email address there at the bottom of the of the page. If you're watching, if you're streaming this, my email address is just my last name, first name. Pick up Nathan at gmail.com. So if you're streaming this and watching it online, you can email me there as well. I do have electronic copies of this. So if you are streaming and you want an electronic copy, feel free to email me and just let me know. I want to thank the elders for paying again for these books. These books weren't free, but they were willing to pay for them so that we could provide them to you. So I just want to give a public thank you to the elders. And if this is something that you're excited to use and, and you maybe use it in my first Peter class, I'd encourage you to thank the elders yourself because again, they're the reason that these are available to us. Now let's launch into our study of 2 Peter. One of the important principles of biblical study is to read the biblical documents the way the biblical authors intend. So when you get a letter from somebody or an email in this day and age, how do you read that letter from somebody? Do you read it in little bits? I'll read a few sentences here and save the rest for tomorrow or next week. No, we read it all the way through. And that's exactly what they did in the first century. So in the first century, when Peter wrote this letter, not every Christian is going to get a copy of this letter and they just read it in the privacy of their own homes. He would send his designated messenger with the letter and that messenger would read the letter publicly all the way through to the church. And so that's how Peter intended this to be read. When he's writing this, or maybe when he's dictating it, to his amanuensis, who's writing it for him. That's how Peter's intending this to be read. This letter is going to be heard, and it's going to be read straight through to my audience. And so just like we did in 1 Peter, that's how I want to start this class. We're going to read 2 Peter together. It'll take us about 10 minutes. And while we're reading it, I want you to be thinking about and looking for answers to the questions on pages 6 and 7. So if you go in your book to pages 6 and 7, we're going to use these questions just to introduce us to this letter this morning. So on page six, the first question is, why has Peter written this letter? Now, I have given you a little hint there where there's a couple passages I put just to kind of give you a, a hint as to where those might be. Although the rest I didn't. You got to fend for yourself on the rest of the questions. But at the bottom of page six, then I ask you, what does Peter's letter reveal about the false teachers and their views that had infiltrated certain churches? Look for that as we read this. Together. And then on page seven, page seven, the top of page seven is just a thought question. Why do you think the false teacher's views would appeal to some in the church? You can't really answer that until you're clear on what exactly the false teachers were teaching. But as you get that, that's just a thought question for us to consider. And then the last question on page seven, what would you say are the main points Peter wants his Christian audience to understand so they can resist the false teaching that's occurring? So just look for those as we read together, and then at the end we'll go through those questions, and I'll ask you, what did you see when we read it? And, and give me the passages where you think, hey, here's the evidence for what I'm saying. It's in chapter 2, verse 15, for example. And we'll look at that together, and this will help to introduce us to the letter. All right, without further ado, let's read this letter the way Peter intended it to be read. So 2 Peter, chapter 1, starting in verse 1. Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities 
is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing, swift, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness, to be kept until the day of judgment. If he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked. For as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority, bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage of their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed. Accursed children, forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world, through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. 
For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from them, to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit and the sow after washing herself returns to wallow in the mire. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoff, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace and count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. All right, that is 2 Peter. So let's use these questions just to kind of introduce us to the big picture here so that we can at least walk out of this first class with just a, a big picture understanding of what 2 Peter is all about, and then we'll flesh that out as we continue on in this class. So I asked you this question first on the top of page 6. Why has Peter written this letter? And for this one, I gave you just a couple verses to look at. And this will just give us, again, a big picture understanding. But what would you say? How would you articulate it based on what he says in chapter 1, verses 12 to 15, and then putting that, connecting that with chapter 3, verses 1 through 3? Why is Peter written this? Yes, Mr. Jim? I think in the third chapter, he says, what sort of people should you be? So he's wanting to remind them about what type of people they are, and why. Why would that be so important to Peter at this stage? You know, what, what, what's, what's drawn his desire to say, I need to talk to them about this? Someone say something. Like that. So one, if you look at 12 to 15, Peter recognizes he's about to die. And so he wants to remind them of some things before he leaves his body, as he, as he puts it. We'll talk about kind of that imagery that he uses there when we get to that section. So one reason he's writing this letter is he's wanting to remind the Christians of the holy qualities that they need for their Christian living. 
And there's two reasons why this is so important for Peter right now when he's writing this. So one is he's about to die, like Rick said. But what's the other reason why Peter wants to make sure he gets this letter out there before he dies? In chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, what's the issue? Yeah. Uh, well, actually, I wasn't going to look at that part. Of the oh, go ahead. Just a very practical answer is in verse 15. It's so that you'll be able to recall what he said at any time. So, so yes. it's not just a very, you know, a physical artifact was, was valuable. So that's why he wrote it too. Yeah, wanting them to be able to recall these things, again, after he's, he's passed on. But why is that, why right now, in other words? So yeah, he's about to die, but there's something else that's caused Peter to say, I've got to get this letter out there now. And I want to make sure that I address something before I die. In chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, what's the issue that Peter wants to make sure? Yeah, Mark? There's false prophets coming. The false prophets, false teachers. The other reason Peter's writing this letter, the reason he wants to stir them up by way of reminder, why that's so pertinent to him in this moment, in this moment in time when he's writing it, is because false teachers have infiltrated the churches and are leading astray Christians. And so he is writing to them to try and combat that false teaching and save these Christians from destruction. That's where these false teachers are taken and these false prophets. In fact, really all of chapter 2 is just one lengthy diatribe against the false teachers. We'll talk about that more when we get there. But I think these two passages, chapter 1, verses 12 to 15, and chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, they give us a, a big picture understanding of why Peter's writing this letter. He wants to remind them of holy qualities they need for their Christian living. And the reason that's so pertinent to him right now is he's having to do that to combat false teachers. And since he's about to die, he needs to do that right now. He wants to get this out there so that even after he passes on, they will have his words to remember and they can stand up to these false teachers, at least those who will choose to do so. Now we'll flesh that out as we go through this quarter. That'll at least give you a big picture, kind of see the forest there before we start examining the trees. That'll give you a big picture understanding of why Peter has written this letter and what and, uh, the main idea is. So here's the next question I asked you. What does Peter's letter reveal about the false teachers and their views? that it infiltrated the churches. What do we discover about them? What were they teaching? Why were they so dangerous? What are the things that they were leading, leading Christians astray? We may not have all the answers and all the details, but Peter does give us a broad outline of what these false teachers were. Did you see any? Did you see anything or notice anything about them? <clears throat> They were, yeah, clear. Uh, creating doubt about whether the second coming was real. So one big thing that they're doing is that they're scoffing at the idea of Christ's second coming. They're saying that's not going to happen. There isn't going to be a second coming. And that's going to be something Peter hits very hard in this letter and addresses. What else? What else do you see? I've got some up here on the screen. I'll put up in just a second, but I want to see what you found. Yeah, Rex. It sounds a lot like a lot of Gnosticism, like very Greek based Gnostic views to me. It's got its kind of worse through it all. Yeah, it could be. Morality. Yeah, it could be that there's maybe the beginnings of some Gnostic views here. Uh, it could be. Again, Peter, we don't have all the details to just be certain about it, but certainly there's at least some similarities that would come up in that later heresy of Gnosticism that would really start really plaguing the church in the second century. But this could be the, uh, the overtures of it, where these ideas are starting to, to permeate the churches. And Rex mentioned something else very important, but I'm just gonna leave it because I wanna see if anyone else, anyone else see anything about what these false teachers are doing in their in their lifestyles? Yeah, that's right. Seems to want to they want to get them to believe that God is not looking, that he can't save them, that he, it doesn't matter what they're doing. They, they're trying to get the Christians to believe that it doesn't matter what they're doing. 
And I, I wouldn't, uh, what do you mean by, when you say that God wouldn't save him? What do you mean by that? Well, it, it says in there that uh, he, he talks about the law. He talks about all these. Oh, I see. That, that, yeah. they, that, they, that God saved them. He rescued them. He, yeah. he knew what they were doing. And he rescued them from yes. their tribes. Gotcha. So the fact that he's hitting on the fact that the righteous will be rescued, maybe these false teachers are shedding doubt on that as well. Yeah, very good. Very good. Anyway, yeah, Margaret, you have your hand up? Yeah, I, I think that to me, a lot of what sticks out is that people, not just that they are being told they should be able to do whatever they want to do, but that Christ rescued them from that futile life. And now, these people are saying, oh yeah, no, that's okay, you can go and do that. And they, they are taken back by those things that have made them filthy rags in the first place. Yes. They've been cleansed, and now they're back into the whole mess. In fact, okay, it's been listen. I'll get you. I'm going to segue with something Margaret said. Yeah, listen. Um, I think too the idea that it says that they infiltrated certain churches secretly is kind of powerful. These aren't just people who came up with some confusion and some misinformation, some wrong ideas. When you infiltrate, that gives the idea that this was a plan. You were targeted. There was a purpose. Yes. Yes. There's a, there's a purpose. These men aren't just honestly mistaken. They are consciously targeting certain Christians in this in, in these Christian groups, which I'll, I'll show you some verses of that in a second. So this is a conscious perversion of Christian teaching. Yeah, Robert. Uh, they're also undermining the creation story of the blood, right? The power of God. Exactly. They're undermining the entire idea of the flood, which really then zooms out into the bigger picture. They're undermining the idea of a final judgment. Is something and Peter's using the flood as a type to say, hey, no, the judgment's coming. God's already given us a type of that in the flood. So one thing, Margaret, what Margaret said is the first thing I want to mention. I usually don't put my thoughts on the screen, but I figured for this, I, I'd go ahead and do it. So I'm just going to list up here some things, not all. There's other things that we could list, but I'm just going to list up here some things and the verses that we can look at where I can show evidence for where I'm getting this. So the first aspect of the false teachers that I want to highlight is they appear to be apostate Christians, meaning they appear to be Christians who were at one time saved, but they have fallen away. They have chosen to pursue heresy so that they can live however they want. So they're apostate Christians. Now let me give you some evidence for that. In chapter 2, verse 1, this one by itself isn't definitive, but again, I think this adds a cumulative effect here. So in, in chapter 2, verse 1, he says at the end of the verse, even denying the master who bought them, which kind of implies, okay, well, they were bought by Christ, but now they are either denying it theologically, or maybe Peter just means they're denying Christ in their lifestyle. We're not really sure. But the master had bought them. Now, someone could argue, well, Peter could just be speaking like in theory, because in theory, Christ has bought everybody, but not everyone's going to respond to that call. Grin, okay, fine. You can maybe argue that one. Peter's just kind of speaking in theory here. But look at verse 15 of chapter 2. Verse 15. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. Well, you can't forsake something that you never had in the first place. In other words, if they were never on the right way, they can't have forsaken it. They were never on it. But Peter says they have forsaken the right way, which implies they were on the right way at one time, but now they've chosen to turn away from it and go astray. And then look at chapter 2, verse 20. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world, through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. I'll stop there. Again, Peter presents them as they had escaped. They had escaped from the defilements of the world, but now they've gotten re-entangled in them and have chosen to just give in and pursue those things that they're now entangled in. Now, there's more verses that, that I think are evidence for this, but I've just given three. That's why in this class, I'll be presenting this as that these are apostate Christians. They have, they were at one time genuine believers, 
but for whatever reason, have now decided to follow heresy and give in to the sinful lifestyle, and now they're trying to bring other Christians with them. Now, I don't know what everyone's view is in this class, because there are some who read 2 Peter, and you know, some subscribe to the view of eternal security, which colloquially, maybe you've just heard it as once saved, always saved. And there may be some in this class that that's, that's what you believe, that yeah, eternal security. And, and I think that's something we can discuss, and I, I certainly don't, I don't draw some line of fellowship there. We may have disagreements over that position, but I would argue that this letter is evidence that Christians can fall away. I would argue. And so that's how I'll be presenting it in this class. And if you're one of those that just is like, no, I just I kind of lean towards the eternal security side very well, you can just kind of listen to the things I say, and we can certainly discuss it. But I would submit this letter as one piece of biblical evidence that says, no, Christians can. They can fall away from the faith. They can be genuinely saved and then choose to fall away from it. Now, a second thing that we get from this letter about the false teachers is that they rejected the apostles' teaching as myth and denied the inspiration of the Hebrew prophets. And you'll see this in 116 and verses 20 to 21 in that section where Peter starts saying, we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we talked to you about the, the coming, that is the parousia, the second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The reason Peter's having to say that is presumably because that's exactly what these false teachers were saying. That that whole second coming thing is just myth that the apostles created. And the Hebrew scriptures, since they're not really inspired, we can kind of make them mean whatever we want them to mean. And Peter combats that in that section, verses 16 to 21. We'll talk more about that section when we get there. Now something else we learn about these false teachers is that they embraced immorality, particularly sexual immorality. <laughs> they embraced immorality, particularly sexual immorality. Look in chapter 2, verse 2. And many will follow their sensuality. And then look at verse 10 of chapter 2. As Peter finishes this section, he then says that those who are going to be uh, judged especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. There's a reason he said that. It's because he's alluding to the false teachers. And we'll, that'll be clear as we study that section. Look at verses 13 and 14 of chapter 2. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime, which may refer to just kind of drunken drunkenness there. And then look at verse 14. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. And then look at verse 18. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh, flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. Now we see in some of these verses that I just mentioned too, you'll see the consciousness of this, about how they're enticing unsteady Christians or they are targeting Christians who have just escaped out of paganism. And so since they're brand new to the faith, they don't have the, the, the roots in Christian living to really stand firm. And now here you go, you have these guys come and saying, hey, give in to those sensual passions of the flesh. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian. Well, you can see for a pagan, be like, oh, that's, I don't have to stop doing those things that I used to do as a pagan. So this is conscious, like I was saying with, with Lester's comment. This is not an honest mistake that they made. This is a conscious perversion of the gospel and of Christian teaching. A fourth thing that we see is that they slandered angelic beings. This is in verses 10 to 12 of chapter 2. Now, we don't know the details of this. In fact, this passage, when we get to it, there's a dispute about exactly, exactly what Peter is saying. But the big picture is clear. They are slandering somehow angelic beings, whether it be demons or righteous angels. There's a question about that. But angelic beings, somehow they're just blasphemy. They're slandering. And also number five gets into their consciousness in this. They are motivated by greed. They were motivated by greed. Look at chapter 2, verse 3. 
And in their greed, they will exploit you. Again, this is conscious by these men. They're greedy. Now look at verse 14. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed. So these men are in it for themselves. What can I get out of this? You can imagine in that day, false teachers coming and churches were instructed to support those who were teachers. Paul talked about that, supporting those who were teaching the gospel. Well, you can imagine these men coming along and saying, hey, we got some teaching for you. And then they're just support me. Bring on the support. Paul talked about that. Don't you, don't you people remember? Because at the end of this letter, Peter will make it clear they're distorting the letters of Paul. That could be one way that they were distorted. His letter. One way. And then number six is what clarified what correctly was saying. They denied Christ's return in the final judgment. And this is going to be kind of throughout the letter, but especially Peter hits this really hard in chapter three. So three, three through ten is a section where Peter is going to specifically talk about that. And then finally, at the end of chapter three, I just mentioned this one. They twisted the scriptures to suit their ends. Which is what Peter says in verses 15 to 16. In fact, one thing to note there, in verses 15 to 16, this is a verse probably you're all familiar with. Um, Count the patience of our Lord of salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom, wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks to them in these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. Peter's not just speaking generally there, as if he's just saying, you know what, I mean, generally, I'll just make a general point about some people who the scriptures. He's alluding to these very false teachers he's been writing about the whole letter. This is something that they were doing. They were twisting the scriptures, and it seems to be particularly the letters of Paul. And we'll talk about why that is, actually, with the next question. So our next question, why do you think the false teacher's views would appeal to some in the church? Why do you think this would have taken root? Why do you think Peter says many will follow their sensuality? Why is that? What would be so appealing about this for Christians? Yeah, Mark? I can get the benefit of this Jesus guy, but I don't have to change what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, imagine if someone starts preaching... Hey, you can be a Christian and you can indulge in whatever sensual passion of the flesh you have. It doesn't take some stretch of the imagination to understand why that's going to appeal to some people. It makes it easier. Especially if you're saying there's not going to be a final judgment. Because those two are interlinked. The, the idea of a final judgment and Christian morality are inextricably connected, which we will see in this letter. You can't de-emphasize one without de-emphasizing the other. If I start de-emphasizing the second coming of Christ and the final judgment, I am inherently also de-emphasizing the moral demands of Christianity. Because if there is no final judgment, it doesn't matter then what we do in our bodies that God has given to us here. Yeah, Mr. Dwight? Invariably, I think they would be using also the appeal of greed to get because like Ponzi schemes and power, political, all this. Yeah. They say, oh, you too can have this. Yes, yes. In fact, what does Peter say in chapter 2, verse 18? This is telling. We'll talk about this when we get there. But in chapter 2, verse 18, or no, chapter, uh, verse 19, I'm sorry. Chapter 2, verse 19. The false teachers promised them, that is the Christians who follow them, freedom. They promised them freedom. You're free in Christ. So sleep with whoever you want to. Indulge in whatever sensual passion you have because Christ has given you freedom. That is an appealing message. That's appealing. If I started teaching that in this culture, American culture, I'd have a lot of followers. Some preachers do teach that in this American culture and they have a lot of followers. So that's what Peter's combating. Now, for time's sake, let me wrap this up. I was going to ask you this. What would you say are the main points Peter wants his Christian audience to understand so they can resist the false teaching that's occurring? 
Let me just say this and we'll wrap up with the letter's main themes, which is on the next page, page eight, uh, that you can fill in there. Broadly speaking, I think there are two main points Peter makes in this letter, and everything he says serves these two broad points. One is, Jesus will return for a final judgment and a renewal of the cosmos. That's one broad point he's making. Jesus will return for a final judgment and a renewal of the cosmos. That is going to happen. It's reality. Now, second, the second broad point is connected to that. Because there's going to be a final judgment, the second broad point is Christianity carries with it certain moral demands. That's just a fact. Christianity carries with it moral demands. Now, those are the two broad points that, that again, I've argued everything Peter says in this letter serves one of those two points. Now, here are the letter's main themes. I like to do this just so you can kind of have, okay, at least at the beginning, here are the main themes Peter's going to hit on in this letter. And some of this will just be reiterating what I just said. So the first one is, like I just mentioned, one main theme of this letter is that the Christian worldview entails certain moral standards. The Christian worldview entails certain moral standards. Peter will develop this theme right at the beginning of the letter. It's the first thing he does after the game. So he establishes this. The second main theme of Peter is, like I've said, there will be a final judgment. There will be a final judgment. Now, there's a few subpoints here that I want to mention. So one, Peter's going to make sure that he makes this clear. This final judgment is predicted in the inspired Hebrew scriptures. In other words, he's not making this up. God already made this clear in the inspired scriptures. In other words, that first century church's Bible, you know, before they had this New Testament that we call their Bible was the Old Testament, or what we call the Old Testament. So this is predicted. And then a second sub-point here under this theme is that the false teachers will receive their condemnation. And righteousness will prevail. Peter makes that very clear in this letter. These false teachers aren't going to get away with this. There is going to be a judgment on the ungodly. And righteousness will prevail. So choose righteousness. Make that choice. Because that's what's going to prevail. And then finally, a third sub-point under this one is. The quote-unquote delay of, the, the, uh, of this judgment is due to God's mercy. So the quote-unquote delay, it's not really a delay. But it looks like that to us. Because of our human concept of time. But the delay of that judgment is due to God's mercy. That's a sub-point that Peter will make under this big theme here as well. And then finally, this one, this last point, this last main theme. False teachers will be a perpetual threat to the Christian community. That is another main theme of this letter that Peter makes clear. That these false teachers are not an anomaly. They were something that were predicted by Christ. That had been plaguing God's people for all time. And they're going to continue to plague God's people up until the time Jesus returns. They will be a perpetual threat to the Christian community. And with those broad themes there, it will give us a big picture to understand what this letter is about. And so next Sunday... We'll start diving into more detail with chapter 1, verses 1 to 15. So I'd encourage you this week, read 2 Peter again. Read it all the way through, the way Peter intended. And then do those questions just on verses 1 to 15 of chapter 1. And I'll look forward to hearing your comments next Sunday. Thank you for your attention today. God be with you this week.